Hey guys, Ms. Peterson here, and this is AP Physics 2, Lecture 1-1, all about pressure in fluids. We're going to be talking about density, absolute versus gauge pressure, and how those play out in static fluids. This corresponds to AP Chemistry topics 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3, and the textbook sections are there for you. So let's go ahead and start with density. Density is probably a familiar concept to you. It is a measure of how much stuff is in a space, okay? Or you could think of it as the mass per volume. And that's basically what the equation is. In physics, we use the Greek letter rho for density, and it's equal to mass over capital V for volume. The primary units that we're going to be using are kilograms per cubic meter. Okay? So, Density of water, 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. That number is going to come up a lot. So just go ahead and memorize it. Now, often we're going to be talking about fluids and the forces on them. So let's think about the force of gravity, a.k.a. the weight of an object in terms of its density. So review. Force of gravity is equal to an object's mass in kilograms times the acceleration due to gravity, g. So if we want to express that in terms of density, we're going to have, okay, well, here we have mass. So that mass is going to be density times volume times g. Okay, so rho v g. That is going to come up as well. So we're going to be talking about pressure. As a reminder, pressure equals force over area, normally in units of Pascal or a Newton meter squared. But what actually causes pressure on like a molecular level? Two things. First one is we got pressure due to the thermal motion of molecules. You might remember from elementary school, in a solid, we have molecules vibrating in place. In a liquid, we have molecules rolling around each other. And in a gas, we have molecules flowing all over the place. Well, these molecules are going to collide with the walls of their container. That's going to happen. And that is what we call pressure. Okay? Pressure is the force due to the collisions of those millions and millions and millions and millions of air molecules with your body. Okay. Now, that's not the only cause of pressure. Okay, When you swim to the bottom of the pool, you know that that's at a higher pressure. And that is also due to gravity. Okay, The pressure at the bottom of something is going to be greater due to the weight of the fluid above it. Right now, you have an entire atmosphere of pressure pushing down on your body. We call that one atmosphere of pressure. It's about 101 uh, kilopascals, but that's just what we're used to, okay? It's a lot of pressure, but it's also exerted on the inside of our bodies, on the walls around us, on the outside of the walls around us, everywhere. So we don't really feel it. Now, there are two ways that we measure pressure. Um, absolute pressure means the pressure of zero is defined as a vacuum, okay? So anytime we're doing um, pressure calculations in, like, space or where we have a vacuum or we have a controlled pressure system, we can talk about the absolute pressure. Your bicycle pump, on the other hand, okay, it does the gauge pressure, a.k.a. the difference in pressure between the inside and the outside of the tire, okay? That difference in pressure is the gauge pressure. And you can think of absolute pressure, okay, as like the pressure of the atmosphere um, plus the gauge pressure. Um, standard pressure, P naught, we use a lot. Um, it is on your equation sheet, you don't actually have to memorize it. It's one times 10 to the fifth pascals. Remembering that, that a pascal is a newton per meter squared. Often you'll see it in kilopascals, where it's 101 
kilopascals. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Let's go ahead and do a practice problem. A vertical column uh, made of cement. Okay, we got a vertical column made of cement. It has a base area of 0 0.50 meters squared and a height of 2.0 meters. Okay, uh, the density of the cement is 3,000 kilograms per meter cubed. How much pressure does this column exert on the ground? Well, let's go ahead and figure it out. We know that pressure is force over area. If we are talking about this cement column, uh, we are talking about the force of gravity. Okay, that's the force that it's going to exert on the ground. So it's weight. Um, and we know it's density, so let's go ahead and use its weight in terms of density. Rho VG, as we have above. Rho VG over the area. And then one of the tricks we kind of use um, is if we look at this, okay, area times height, the area of a circle, area of the base times the height of it, that's going to equal the volume of that cylinder. <clears throat> so if I rewrite volume as area times height, I can simplify this equation even more. It really doesn't matter what that base area is. It's going to exert the same pressure on the ground because pressure is just that force per area. So our equation simplifies to rho hg, and I can plug in my numbers then. We have 3,000 kilograms per cubic meter times 2.0 meters times gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. And we plug that all into our calculator and we get 58, oops, 58,800. And then let's look at the units. We have a meter and a meter, cancels out with the meter squared, leaves one meter left on the bottom. And we have weird units left, kilogram, meter per second squared. Now, those don't look very familiar for, to me. They don't look like units of pressure. But let's go ahead and check if that is in fact a Pascal or a Newton per square meter. So do some unit analysis here. Okay, we have kilograms per meter squared. We know that a pascal is a newton per meter squared, and newton is the units of force, so mass times acceleration units, kilograms times meters per second over meters squared. So we have a kilogram meters per second divided by meters squared. We can see that one of those meters We'll cancel out. I'm going to actually go ahead and rewrite this to make it a little bit clearer. Kilogram meter per second squared. And then if we're dividing by um, meter, meter squared, okay, one over meter squared, make it easier to see. Okay, cancel out that meter. We're left with one. So it simplifies to, what do you know, kilogram meter over second squared which is the units that we have. So our answer, if we round it to two digits, match that precision, we have a pressure of about 59 kilopascals. Okay. So again, that's equal to 58,800 pascals change it into kilopascals and round it off to get 59 kilopascals. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. So let's talk about the pressure in those bottoms of pools. Okay. Why is there more pressure at the bottom? Well, you know, you have the weight of all of the fluid above you. So, 
that equation for the pressure in a fluid becomes P naught, the pressure at the surface, normally atmospheric pressure, <coughs> plus <clears throat> the weight of that column. And we just saw in that previous example, we can express the weight of any column of fluid as rho hg. On your equation sheet, it's there as rho g h. Okay. But that is basically just that weight of the fluid. Yep. Okay, cool. Which brings us to this classical problem. How would the pressure compare across each of the dotted lines in the various shape containers below? So we're talking about the pressure here, the pressure here versus here versus here. Yep. Now, a common kind of instinct is to say that there's going to be more pressure in that first container because it has more fluid above it. But that's not the case. If we look at the equation, if we really think about it, the depth is the only thing that determines the pressure. So it's going to be the same in all, okay? The same across all of those dotted lines because it's only dependent on depth. But why, okay? If it was that cement column, it would be the entire weight of it that would be that force on the ground, the entire weight of that whole column. So why is that not true for these fluids? And it really has to do with the behavior of fluids themselves, okay? They exert pressure in every direction, okay? Including in this direction. So yeah, there will be more pressure on the bottom there, but some of the weight of that fluid is supported by the walls of its container. It's not all just on the bottom. Okay, so the only thing that determines the pressure is depth. Yep. So let's talk about how we measure atmospheric pressure. Okay, it's always going to be a balance. Because of that thing, the pressure is always going to be even at a certain depth in a fluid. So we can take advantage of this when we made barometers. Um, there's a great TED Ed video on barometers that I recommend you check out. I'll link it in the description. Um, but a barometer is how we measure atmospheric pressure. And basically, if we're looking at this, Mercury was used because mercury has a very, very low vapor pressure, okay? No mercury vapor, okay? This wouldn't work with something like water, okay? We would have to take into consideration the pressure of the water vapor up in there. But mercury doesn't have much, so we can pretty much treat it like a vacuum. So if you zoom in right on this area, that's what they're showing here. The pressure is going to be even across that line, meaning that the atmospheric pressure will be equal to the weight of that column, the weight of that column of mercury, okay? So we use this to figure out the air pressure. When that mercury column's taller, we know air pressure is higher. When it's lower, then the air pressure isn't pushing down as hard. Okay, cool. Um, and again, that would just be the atmospheric pressure uh, yeah, out here would equal the weight of this column because there's no vacuum there. So then it'd just be that rho GH for the mercury. Okay, so let's go ahead and do a couple more example problems. <clears throat> a bathysphere is a deep water exploration value. Okay, it's in fresh water. So, fresh water and the depth. Oh, we normally use H for depth. Why? I don't know. We just do. It is 300 meters. It has a window with a diameter. Oh, maybe that's why we used it, D for diameter, of 20 centimeters. Get in the habit. We're going to be finding the area of this. We know that. So, Whenever you see the diameter, rewrite that radius. It'll be 10 centimeters, aka 0 0.1 meter. And we want to know the force of the water on the window. 
<coughs> well, it's water. So its density is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. If we're looking for the force, well, we know that the force is the pressure times that area. And it acts in all directions. So the force will be the pressure, uh, which we could find from P naught plus rho GH, that due to the depth of fluid, times the area of that window, which it's a circle, so pi r squared. Well, let's go ahead and plug in our numbers. Come on. So, atmospheric pressure, we're just going to assume it's standard pressure, unless it tells you differently, just assume standard pressure. So we have one times 10 to the fifth, plus the density of water, 1,000, times G, 9.8, times that depth, oh, 300 meters, okay, times the area, which is given to us by pi, times 0.1 meter squared. Okay. And we plug that all into our calculator, and we should get 9.55 times 10 to the fourth Newtons. Okay, cool. If you did just the pressure, if you had solved that out, uh, it comes out to 3.04 times 10 to the sixth Pascals, and then you're just multiplying it by that area. Again, making sure that we're converting to meters since Pascals are in meters. Let's talk about suction cups. Okay. A suction cup is used to hang, you should say hang, a sign from the ceiling. Which of the following statements is correct? Okay, so how suction cups work is they work by creating that difference in pressure. Basically, give me one second. Here's one of my cat's toys that uses a suction cup to hold it. So when you flatten this against a wall and you're pushing all of that air out from beneath it, okay, and then my cat comes and pulls it, pulls it a little bit out, now all of a sudden there's a lower pressure system inside the suction cup than there is out here, so it stays in place. Now which of these descriptions kind of matches and explains that? Well, the first one says the force of the air upward is greater than the weight of the suction cup. Well, if the force was greater, then it would be moving upward, and it's, it's just hanging and chilling, so that doesn't make sense. The pressure of the air upward on the suction cup is equal to the weight of the suction cup and the sign. So what that's saying is that the pressure upward is equal to the weight. Okay, but that pressure is coming from all directions. Yeah, it's coming up, but it would also be coming from down. And you're trying to compare weight and pressure, which does kind of work. But mm, let's go ahead and come back to that one. Okay. The difference in pressure on the inside about the outside of the cup equals the weight of the suction cup. See, now this is a better answer, okay? Because it is going to be that difference. The pressure of the air upward, there's still gonna be some air in that suction cup pushing it downward, okay? And it's that difference in pressure that creates the force, okay? Difference in pressure times area, so you can relate that to the force a lot easier. And uh, canceling gravity, no, you, you, you don't cancel gravity. You can balance out the force of gravity, you don't cancel it. Now, we use these a lot, okay? These principles are used a lot, specifically in hydraulics. And this has to do with that idea that any pressure applied to a fluid is transmitted uniformly throughout that fluid. 
<clears throat> so since the pressure in a fluid is the same, we can use that fluid to transmit a force. A small force applied to a small area can result in a larger force applied to a larger area. That's how hydraulic jacks work. Okay? The pressure at any two points, like say A and B in this, are going to be equal. So if I do a force on this area, I am then exerting a pressure of, uh, ta -da. let's see, we got pressure is force per area 30 divided by point. If we look at this hydraulic jack, if we exert a force of 30 newtons to an area of two meters, that is a pressure of 150 newtons per meter squared or pascals. So I'm going to be able to get that same pressure on my output of 150 newton per meter squared. Since my area now is one meter squared, I can support 150, or I get 150 newtons of force out for my 30 newtons in, right? And that's understanding it through pressure. That the pressure at A equals the pressure at B. So if we do the force of A over the area at A equals the force at B over the area at B. It's just a ratio thing. And that's how we can get that that force B is 150 newtons. Now, there's one other way to understand how hydraulics work, and that's through conservation of energy. Okay? We can think of this as a simple machine, where the work that we put in equals the work that we put out. <coughs> work in equals the work out. Now, if you remember, work is force times displacement. So F delta X. Okay. You can think of this. If you're putting 30 newtons, okay, you are going to be moving this down like quite a bit, a bigger distance. Okay. But that volume of water that moves, that's going to be constant. You can't change that volume of water. So when you go over here, to a much bigger area, it's going to move a much shorter distance. Okay, because that volume is the same. Okay, volume is same. So the delta x in will be much, much greater than that delta x out. Okay, okay, cool. Okay, cool. So let's test your understanding of this. How is it possible for a bent tube to have different levels of liquid like this? Well, if both of these were just open to air up here, it wouldn't be possible. Not possible if both are open to air, okay? If they're both open to air at the same pressure, it wouldn't be possible. This can only be possible if you had something like a container here and you were able to change its pressure, okay? You would need the higher pressure on one side, okay? If there were more air molecules here pushing down on that surface than there were here, we would have those different levels. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. So let's look at another application of this, okay, with a column of mercury. As we've said, pressure is even across any line in a fluid. Um, this says uh, waster, that is a typo. It should say water. Okay. So if we're looking for the height of this column of mercury and we know that height of water, we know that this pressure is going to be even and we can find the pressure of this water. Okay, so let's go ahead and write this out. We have the pressure here, which would be P naught, <coughs> excuse me, plus the density of mercury. 
times G times the height of the mercury. And if it's okay with you guys, I'm going to just use the chemical symbol for mercury, Hg. So density mercury, G, the height of mercury. And that's going to equal the height of this column of water, which is atmospheric pressure plus the density of water times G times the height of that water. And now our equation is going to get a lot more simplified. Atmospheric pressure is the same on both sides, so we can cross that out, which leaves us just rho GH equals rho GH. We can cancel out those gravities. So the height of the column of mercury will just be the density of the water times the height of the water divided by that density of mercury. Just that simple ratio. So we have 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed times the height of the water, 0 0.10 meters, divided by the density of mercury, which we would have to look up in a table. Okay, I googled it for you. The density of mercury is 13,546 kilograms per cubic meter. Cancel, cancel, and we get a height of 0 0.00738 meters, which we normally wouldn't leave like that. We'd probably want to say, let's see, boom, 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 7.38 millimeters of mercury. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Last problem. <clears throat> a hydraulic jack is made of two pistons, as shown in the diagram, with the smaller piston having an area of 0 0.01 meters squared and the larger one having an area of 0 0.20 meters squared. What force would be required to hold up a 1,500 Newton, 300-pound football player? Okay. So since we know that the pressure is going to be equal, we know that uh, the force over the area is going to be equal. And it is just a simple ratio at that point. Okay, P1 equals P2. So force 1 over 0 0.01 meters squared equals <clears throat> 1,500 newtons divided by 0 0.20 meters squared. So we get that that force needed is going to be 75 newtons. Which makes sense. We have about 20 times the area. So we need about 1 20th of the force. Does that check out? Yes, it does. Okay, cool. Okay, cool.